Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. I'm glad to be here. Uh, <laughs> I still have a pinched nerve, and so I am, it is still in pain, and there is some discomfort, but uh, it is getting better. And I wanted to start by saying how grateful I am, how blessed I have felt for the outpouring of love and support and care and concern for me and my family this past week. Your your cards, your emails, your calls uh, have meant a lot to me, and I'm very thankful for that. This morning's lesson is entitled, Salvation Came to His House. <clears throat> How many of you, and, and I would guess probably many of you, may remember a old late 1980s movie about two not-so-bright high schoolers who uh, just wanted to form a band and they went on an excellent adventure time traveling for a history project that they had to do in order to graduate high school to make that band a reality. At the beginning of that movie one of them was asked what he knew about Napoleon Bonaparte and his answer was very brief and concise and to the point he said a short dead dude <clears throat> after having watched that movie being a cocky teen and being in a Bible class a little later on, I was asked, who was Zacchaeus? <laughs> I would guess that you, knew what my, you know what my answer was. A short, dead dude. This morning, as we look in our text from Luke 19, 1 to 10, I hope that by the end of this morning's lesson, if you don't already, you'll have a much better answer prepared than I did. Before we get into Luke 19, 1-10, though, there are three passages I want us to keep in mind as we read through this account. Three passages that I want us to be looking at, at this account of Zacchaeus through the eyes of these three passages. And we're going to start in Ephesians 3, 20-21. And I appreciate very much Dick brought this up in the adult Bible class as we talked about the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 of the two different times Jesus abundantly fed the multitude. And we'll talk about that in just a second. In Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That word, this passage, always reminds me of God doing things above and beyond what we would ask or think. That far more abundantly isn't just one word, it's a phrase that the English has to translate from this Greek word, hooper. It means super abundant. There are translations out there that will actually translate this as super abundant. That is what it means. It means far superior, more than what we would ask, more than what we would even think. Dick brought this passage up this morning in talking about the 5,000 and the 4,000 uh, multitudes of men, not counting even women and children, so a greater multitude than even those numbers, where Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, and the 4,000 with seven loaves and a few fish, it says. There was an abundance. He didn't just feed them a little, where they all got something. They ate till they were satisfied, and in the case of the 5,000, there were 12 baskets left over, and seven baskets left over a few months later when the feeding of the 4,000 occurred. Jesus did far more abundantly than what they could have ever even imagined. Jesus does that still for us today. He does far more superior and more than we would even ask or think. The second passage I want us to look at the account of Zacchaeus with the eyes of is through Luke 19.10. This is how this passage in our text is wrapped up. Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I, called, I have often called this Jesus' mission statement. I remember a college project one time we had to come up with a business plan and whether we were put in groups and we had to come up with a business plan and we had to work it down from from the bottom up the top down however you want to say it and the very first thing that the instructor told us we had to come up with that would drive the rest of our thoughts and planning for this business was we had to come up with a name and we're second to the name we had to come up with a mission statement and the mission statement would drive the rest of our goals for this business when I look in Luke 19:10. Jesus says his mission on earth was to come to seek and to save the lost. Seek is this word zeteo. 
from Strong's 22.12, and it means to seek, literally or figuratively. It means a strong desire. Jesus said he desired to save the lost. In 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, Paul says that God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is that seeking. This is that desire that Jesus came with to save the lost. And the third passage I want us to read before we get into Luke 19 is Hebrews 11 and verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Reading from the New King James, the New American just says seek. The New King James adds diligently, and it's not adding. What it's really doing is literally translating what the Greek word means. Here, that word is exeteo. You remember that the word in Luke 19.10 is zeteo. This is exeteo. That means to search out, to investigate, crave, Demand, seek after carefully, seek after diligently. This is, is more than just seeking. This is a, a craving to seek. This is not being satisfied until it is found. He says, God is a rewarder of those who seek him in that manner. Faith pleases God. And here we find it's more than just an expression of faith. There are those that say, I, I believe in him, but they don't go any further than that. This is more than just an expression. This is action. The one that diligently seeks after him, he will reward. And so looking at these three passages, I want us to look at the account of Zacchaeus through the eyes of these three things that we just talked about. And I want you to note as we read through Luke 19, 1 to 10, look how many times these three passages come into play. And so with that in mind, let's begin turning over to Luke 19. And as you're turning there, I want us to kind of combine what we just talked about. That God does more than we ask or think. God desires or seeks man to be saved, but man must diligently seek him to be rewarded. And we must be reminded that God wants to reward. He wants to reward us. He wants to do far more abundantly more than what we can think or ask. God rewards those who diligently seek him, not enough to claim to believe in him. And lost, he says he came to seek and save the lost. Lost is perhaps one of the most frightening words in the Bible. It describes one who is in sin, one who is perishing. 2 Corinthians 4.3 describes those in the world as perishing. That means they're dying. And there is cause for celebration and rejoicing when the lost become found. In Luke 15, as we spend a couple weeks looking at the angels rejoicing, the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. Jesus told us this is something that is ongoing every time it happens. Luke 15, 7 and Luke 15 and verse 10. We can see all of these three concepts come together in the account of Zacchaeus. We saw all of it played out in a lost man who diligently sought to see Jesus. He diligently sought him. He desired to see him so much. He climbed into a sycamore tree to do so. So read with me in this account in Luke 19, starting in verse 1. It says, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And before services, I asked Dick if he'd lead us in a rousing rendition of Zacchaeus was a wee little man. But unfortunately, he said he didn't know that song, so maybe even sing it in your head as we go through. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Jesus identifies him as a lost individual. He climbed a tree to see Jesus. 
We see here played out in verse 10, Jesus' mission statement, to seek and save that which was lost. And that he rewards those who diligently seek him, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. He does more than what we ask or think. I want you to think about this. Zacchaeus just wanted to see him. He just wanted to see who he was. But because he was short, he couldn't see. So he climbed into a tree to see over the crowds. That's all he wanted to do. He, he didn't even dare think that he could talk to him. He just wanted to see him. But Jesus wanted to see him too. Jesus wanted to meet him. And Jesus wanted to be a guest in his house. You see, all three of these verses play out in this account. Salvation came to the house of the man who climbed the tree to see Jesus. So let's talk about who Zacchaeus was. We're going to look at him in three different ways. Well, let's talk about his good points first. Those things that are recorded for us and just the introduction to him that we might know. He wanted to see Jesus. Verse 3 tells us he wanted to see who he was. He would not be turned from his purpose. The crowds were great. The multitude was around. He couldn't see where Jesus was coming down the road into Jericho. But he overcame his obstacles. Luke 19, verse 3, the crowds, his small stature, he was short. These did not deter him. He could have turned around. He could have said, I am not going to see it today. Maybe another time. Or maybe try to keep his ear open to the next city Jesus would be into following there. He could have gone home right then and there. But he was determined. Remember what it means to be diligent? To crave, to investigate, to not be satisfied until it is found? He would not be deterred. He diligently sought after Jesus. So in verse 4, he ran and climbed a sycamore tree. Instead of running away, instead of going home, instead of being deterred, he climbed up into a sycamore tree to get a better view. These are some very good points that we can look at Zacchaeus. And let's look at also these points about his character that are indifferent, neither good nor bad. He was rich. This didn't make him good or bad, but the text bears this out, and I think there's a, a reason why it's borne out that way. This did not make him necessarily good or bad, verse 2. 1 Timothy 6.10 and 1 Timothy 6.17-19 and 19 tells us that it's not a sin to be rich, but it's the love of money that is the root of all evil, not money itself. In fact, he says to those, Paul instructs Timothy to instruct those who are rich in material blessings to share with those that have not. He says use their money, use their funds for good. He didn't say that, that they need to get away from that. So it's not a sin to be rich. This didn't make him good or bad. In short, this didn't make him good or bad, verse 3. and That gives hope to short people everywhere. Amen. I, I look up to Zacchaeus in that way. <laughs> it doesn't matter our stature. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter our social status. Jesus wants to see us. And he wants us to want to see him. That Jesus was willing to come and see this man who was short. Short didn't make him a bad person or good. Jesus wanted to see this man that was a chief tax collector. His job didn't make him good or bad that way either. Even though he was looked down on others. In verse 7, when they called him a sinner, whether that was true or not, he was prejudged by his job because they didn't care for him. He was a Jew, verse 9. He was a tax collector, verse 2. Tax collectors worked for the Romans. They gathered taxes. In this case, being a Jew, he was even especially hated. A Jew collected taxes from his fellow Jews. And they hated paying taxes to their oppressive rulers. In fact, there was a matter of taxes where at one time they tried to trap Jesus. And they said, is it lawful for us to pay tax? Remember that his famous answer? Whose likeness is on the money? Caesar's. Well, then render to Caesar what is Caesar. Render honor to God what is due God. Jewish tax collectors were considered the scum on the bottom of the sandals of the scum of the earth. They were, they were beneath the Gentiles. They were traitors to their own people. In some cases and places, they were considered lower than Gentiles and dogs. And in fact, many times as Jesus traveled through the multitudes and even drew the tax collectors to himself, they would grumble and say he eats with sinners and tax collectors. They were their own group of scumbags, right? There was the sinners, and then there was the tax collectors. 
And here they identify Zacchaeus as both. In verse 7, they look down on him. His job didn't make him good or bad. We can see in Matthew 9 and verse 9 that Matthew himself was an apostle and was called to be an apostle from being a tax collector. In fact, as Jesus passed by, it says he saw Matthew, also called Levi, sitting in the tax booth. So it was tax time. And Jesus said, follow me. Matthew left it, and he followed Jesus. And he became an apostle. So as we look at Zacchaeus through his good points and in different points, whether we, as we look at his social status and his stature, he did have some bad points. Verse 8 indicates he may have become rich at the cost of others. This was one of the reasons the Jews hated tax collectors. Under Roman law, usually tax collectors were a family. You, you passed on that job, and that job passed down to your descendants and their descendants after them. And so you, once you were a tax collector, you kind of locked your family into that. But under Roman law, a tax collector would collect the taxes for the Romans, but they were also allowed to collect more than that and keep whatever extra as long as Rome got their money. They didn't care how much you took everyone else for. And so oftentimes the tax collector was sitting rich because they collected more than what they were supposed to collect. And Roman law allowed that. That was how they made their money. Zacchaeus may have lived up to their hatred and distrust. He says, if I have defrauded anyone. He may have been uncharitable. Verse 8. It says in verse 8, he said, Zacchaeus stopped and said to him, or said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. He may have been uncharitable. It almost sounds as if he had never done it before, and he's now declaring he's going to do it. He's vowing to do so. And he was lost. Verse 10, Jesus went to the Jews first, and here is one of the fruits of his efforts. Here is a man that diligently sought Jesus, and Jesus did for him far more abundantly than what he even thought could happen. A man who was lost became found. Jesus points out in verse 9 and 10 that he was a child of Abraham. That means he was a Jew. And yet they looked down on him as if he was his own special kind of class of people. You see, that didn't matter to Jesus. What Jesus saw was Zacchaeus was a lost man who was diligently seeking to be found. Whether he knew that or not, he just wanted to see Jesus. Remember that? That's all he was trying to get out of climbing that sycamore tree, was just to see Jesus, get a glimpse of him as he walked by. And Jesus did far more abundantly for him than what he ever asked or thought. He said, Zacchaeus, hurry down from there. I'm staying at your house today. As we look at Zacchaeus, we can see his great change. And it began with curiosity. Verse 3 of Luke 19 tells us he wanted to see who he is. If one doesn't have interest, one, one, one won't find salvation. No interest, no salvation. If we don't seek him, we won't find him. Indifference is a curse. If you don't know one is lost, then that one doesn't know that they need a savior. We read in verses 5 and 6 that he received Jesus gladly. When Jesus said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. You can just hear the scorn and dislike in their voices. But I want you to think about this. It could have also been a little bit out of jealousy. Out of everyone in the crowd, out of everyone in the crowd, all the people that, that gladly saw Jesus, that openly saw him, out of everyone in that crowd that day, Jesus wanted to see Zacchaeus. We read in verse 4, it says, or in verse 5, it says he looked up. When he got to the place, he looked up and he looked right at him. Jesus wanted to see him. He wanted to meet him. And he wanted to be a guest in his house. Remember that passage, Ephesians 3, 20 through 21? Super abundant. Far more abundantly than what we think or ask. This was, was far greater than what Zacchaeus thought when he climbed into the tree. To just see him, but then to be noticed by him. 
And more than just an acknowledgement of his existence, Jesus says, I must stay at your house today. And it says he received him gladly. He could have said, oh no, Lord, my house is messy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not ready. I just wanted to see you. I don't really want to visit with you. No, you, you keep on going. I don't want to be a bother. He says he hurried down. He obeyed. He did what Jesus said. Jesus said, hurry and come down from there. He came down fast and it says he gladly received him. But then note his repentance in verse 8. The New King James says he stood and said, he, he makes a public declaration. He's making a public declaration. He's saying, I'm going to be charitable. He resolves to be charitable. I want you to contrast this with the rich young ruler. And this is why I believe it points out at the very beginning passage in Luke 19 that he was rich. Luke chapter 18. This, is, this just happened. Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler just happened. In Luke 18, 18 through 23. It says, A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this is a man recognizes he's lost. He finds Jesus. He comes to him, and he, and he asks the question. That, that's the million-dollar question. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. Now you can almost hear the, this young man saying, oh, I've been doing these things since I was five. You know, ah, that's all Jesus asked of me. I, I'm good. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Notice he didn't say impossible. He said it's, it's hard. It's difficult. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then his disciples got upset. And they said, well, then who can be saved? And then we go into Luke chapter 19. And we're introduced to Zacchaeus, this chief tax collector, who was very rich. The contrast is there. The rich young ruler was also lost, seeking to be saved. He even knew the scriptures. But he went away grieved. He diligently sought Jesus, but he went away disappointed in what he found. Zacchaeus was blessed with material wealth, and he resolved to give half of what he owned to the poor. Contrast that with the rich young ruler. See, money didn't make him good or bad. It was what he did with it. It was maybe even how he obtained it. But here he resolves to be charitable. In his repentance, he says, I'm going to give half of it. He vowed to make restitution fourfold. Perhaps telling Jesus he knew the scriptures too. In Exodus chapter 22 and verse 1, under the old law, requirement of a thief was to pay four or five times the worth of what they had stolen. When you say you've defrauded somebody, that's a fancy way of saying, I stole from them. Right? You took something that didn't belong to you. He defrauded them. He says, if I have defrauded them, I'll pay four times. Zacchaeus had knowledge of the scriptures. Perhaps he had stolen and he was admitting it here. He had the right heart, a charitable heart. Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Place a marker there in Luke 19 and turn over with me to Ephesians 4. Under the old law, a thief had to pay back four times. Under the new law... Even after coming to obey the gospel, thieves have to make restitution. Part of, the, part of that repentance is to make it right. In Ephesians 4 and verse 28, it says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he'll have something to share with one who has need. Thieves once converted are to steal no longer. They're to work for their living, and they're to share. That means they're to have a charitable heart. They're to be charitable. This is what Zacchaeus was vowing to do. He didn't have Ephesians 4.28 then. 
He had the old law. He had Exodus 22, verse 1. He says, I will make restitution four times. I will give back. I will make amends. He was a lost man desiring to be saved. And when he was found, he accepted the terms for salvation. He didn't go away grieved. He didn't go away disappointed like the rich young ruler did. He diligently sought Jesus and was so blessed to be found by him that he changed. He repented and he was blessed for it. In fact, Jesus pronounced that Zacchaeus' salvation came to his house. Pronounced by the Lord in verse 9 of our text, going back to Luke 19. It says, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. Salvation has come to this house. Wouldn't we want to hear such a proclamation, such a declaration made about us, made about our household, our family? Salvation has come to this house. But there were terms. Forsake old sin, resolve to do good, Again, going back to the old law, Isaiah, Isaiah 55 and verse 7, God pardons the wicked who turns from his way. Here Jesus is saying Zacchaeus was going to receive that pardon. He says salvation has come to this house. You know, there are lessons we can learn today from the man who climbed a tree to see Jesus. We need to seek him to let nothing get in our way of being found. James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Hebrews 11.6 says, Faith pleases God, but God rewards those who diligently seek Him. God wants to reward, and He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Once found, accept the terms and obey the gospel. Under the new covenant, when the Jews on the day of Pentecost, after being accused of murdering Jesus, asked the apostles, Brethren, what do we do? Peter said to them in Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. Ananias told Saul in Acts 22 and verse 16 to arise and be baptized, washing away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We find in Acts chapter 8, 36 to 38, Philip, an Ethiopian eunuch, in teaching Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch, it caused him the eunuch to say, stop the chariot, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? When we sin, we need to repent. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 says, if we repent of our sins, if we confess our sins to God, it says He is faithful to forgive us and bring us back into a state of righteousness. John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3 and verse 8, He told the Jews then coming down to the Jordan to be baptized by Him, to keep doing the fruits of repentance. Paul in Acts chapter 26 and verse 20 in his defense to, to, to King Agrippa, he told Agrippa that after he obeyed the divine command from God, that he went into the, all the areas of the Jews and Gentiles preaching, and he told them to keep the deeds appropriate to repentance. See, once we're converted, once we repent, oftentimes there are still amends and restitution that needs to be made. Being converted does not absolve us from the consequences, oftentimes, of the sin that we've committed. This was a, a hard lesson for many in the prison that I used to teach Bible classes at. Some of them had the attitude of once they were converted, they thought that the warden should just let them go. They still had restitution to make. And while they received pardon and salvation could even come to a house such as that, and I saw that with my own eyes, I could see men absolutely changed and they would be a benefit to society when they got out. And I, I still am in contact with one such man that studied with me for a few years and he got out and he's still attending faithfully when he can in, in the, at the congregation in Anchorage. Salvation can even find the right heart in a place such as that when the heart is willing and ready to make amends and fruits and deeds appropriate to repentance. Zacchaeus was such a man. I will give to the poor. I will make restitution. When we sin, we need to repent. This man was of the house of Abraham. He was a Jew, and yet he was lost until he was found. And salvation came to his house. He was a lost man. He became found. And Jesus pronounced that salvation had come to his house. Anyone can be saved who will pay the price. And as obedience to the gospel. Hebrews 5.9, Jesus is the source of eternal salvation for those who obey him. It is scary to be lost. 
If you have ever been lost in your life, whether as a kid, as a child, or maybe one of your own children lost for a time, it's scary to be lost, to have that feeling of panic, to not know where you are, to not know, and perhaps you know where you are, but you don't know where your family is, or whatever the case may be. It's scary to be lost. But there's great rejoicing when the one who is lost is found. Both men and angels rejoice. We rejoice over family members. We rejoice when we hear of our neighbors that are found. But even more importantly than in the physical sense, when that soul that is perishing, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 describes them, when that soul is perishing because they're lost, and that soul is found, they diligently seek him, they find him, and they repent of their sins and obey the gospel. There is great rejoicing in heaven by the angels over the sinner that turns from his wicked ways. Zacchaeus was lost, Luke 19.10. But he didn't let obstacles or distractions get in the way of his Savior. Remember, just to recap, he just wanted to see Jesus, Luke 19.3. He climbed up in a tree to get a better view and is rewarded beyond what he thought by Jesus taking notice of him, calling him by name and saying, I'm going to stay in your house today. I want you to keep in mind Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, that God is able to do far more abundantly what we even think or can ask. God rewards those who diligently seek him. Reading from the Hebrews 11 and verse 6. But I want you to think of another thought. Think of how many lost there were in that crowd that day. How many who openly saw Jesus, easily saw Jesus, those that were the closest to him, thronging around him. And think of how many of those lost in that crowd that day and how many, like the rich young ruler, went away still lost. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? There were those who had easy access to him. Those who could easily see him, which is all Zacchaeus wanted to do, and remember. All he wanted to do was get a glimpse. And there were those who could easily see him. There were those that could throw him enough they could touch him. But how many were lost in that crowd? And after this encounter, we still went away lost. The question that we need to ask after that sobering thought is, one, do you seek the Lord? Do you diligently seek after him? Do you want to know him? Zacchaeus let nothing get in his way. This reminds me of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. We're about to close, so I'd ask you to turn with me. The Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. As we close out on another thought. And that is, as we apply what we've learned today. It's so easy in life to let things take us away from our studies. To let things take us away from the priorities that truly, eternally matter. There are some people who say, well, I'm just too busy. If you're too busy for God, if you're too busy to study, then you're too busy. Right? Zacchaeus let nothing get in his way. Notice Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. We too are going to let nothing get in the way, no matter what the distractions in the world are. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We are to be like Zacchaeus. We're going to let nothing get in the way. He could have been deterred by the crowds. He could have been deterred by the stature. I, I, I can't even jump as high to see over people's shoulders, whatever it was. I'm just going to go away. How often in the world, in our lives, do we let things of the world distract us, entangle us, pull us away? Where at the end of the day, we're like, well, I didn't have time. And we retreat to wherever that retreat is. Do you want to see Jesus? Do you seek after him? Do you want to see him? Do you want to know who he is? Notice that Zacchaeus overcame those obstacles to see him. He overcame the crowds. He overcame his stature. He overcame their disdain for him. He overcame their scorn for his very existence. He didn't let what they thought of him make him turn aside the Lord. When they said, he's going to go and be with a sinner, Zacchaeus gladly received him. Notice with me the rest of this passage in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. After saying, run with endurance the race that is set before us, notice where our eyes ought to be. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, 
the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus, too, was looked down on. Jesus, too, was despised and scorned and mocked and hated. But he didn't let that deter him either. And it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. At the end of the day, Zacchaeus had every reason to rejoice. We too, when we think of the blessings that Jesus has done for us, being in a family of God that is far above and beyond any physical family, the scope of which has no borders, having the blessing of forgiveness of our sins when we repent of them, the blessing of prayer that there is no middleman, we can go and pray to God directly through Christ and in his name. The blessing of that hope of eternal life that awaits us if we will but do the deeds appropriate to repentance and remain faithful. Do you seek after the Lord? Do you want to see Jesus? Salvation comes to the house of those who diligently seek God and obey him. He rewards eternal life. Hebrews 5, 9, Hebrews 11, 6. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 tells us he goes above and beyond what we think or ask. He's able to do super abundantly for us in our lives. I hope this morning as we study Zacchaeus that you might be encouraged. That no matter your background, no matter your stature, no matter your social status, whether in your own eyes or everyone else's eyes, if you diligently seek him, he will reward you. If you're not a Christian this morning, I urge you to become one. To recognize that you are lost. That you might diligently seek him. Repent of your sins and be baptized into his name and walk with him in new life. And if you are a Christian this morning with sin in your life, don't let that sin keep you from climbing that tree to see Jesus. Don't let that sin entangle you and keep you from coming to him and making it right. Get rid of that sin. Lay aside that encumbrance. Come to him repenting of your sins and be renewed. And if we can assist you in any of these things, the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, Come forward and let me know now while we stand.